I bless you all. Good to have you with us today. This is a a time to celebrate. I I feel like in our worship today, there was something really authentic here, just a a presence of being able to authentically be ourselves. And I just want to recognize that this is the way we can live every day. We can live knowing that the promises of God are real to us as the scriptures are so timeless. There are so many promises that God has unlocked for us that are a part of the identity by which he has called us. He has identified us as sons and daughters. I'd like to do just a little bit of review then to get into the meat of the message today. And first of all, is to recognize, as we talked about last time, there is power in our agreement with him. You notice in Matthew 5, 37, it says, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now recognize there is power in giving your yes to a situation, in making a decision. Things begin to shift once you make that decision. And God has empowered you to do that, to say, I say no to this evil thing that's happening, and I give this my yes right now. And it's taking a stand in the spirit and saying, this is what I see is God's will in this situation. And I'm going to speak that out. I'm going to make declarations over it. And that is the power of our yes. And I have found this in my own personal life too. That difficult thing that I don't know how to do, that I cannot seem to get over it, is the very thing that God's calling me to take action on. And as I do that, as I take that step in faith to give him my yes, that's where the breakthrough begins to happen. I begin rising up in the authority that God has given to me. And I know this is true for you too. And think of those times when you took a stand and you said, hey, I know that God is calling me to pray in this situation. God's calling me to stand up in the spirit. And last week, we also talked about how we are made to be more than conquerors. In Romans 8, beginning in verse 36, all day long we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. Yet, even in the midst of these things, we triumph over them all, for God made us to be more than conquerors. You see, this is a beautiful thing. He's made us to be absolutely victorious. And we spent some time on this last week because it doesn't matter what we're facing. That thing may appear to be really, really big, and it's a huge mountain to overcome. But see, God made a declaration over us, and he said, I don't care about the size of your mountain, because I have made you to be more than a conqueror. And why? Why are we more than a conqueror? It's the end of that verse. It's because of his demonstrated love in our glorious victory. His demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Now, what else does that leave behind? Everything is everything, right? (laughs) So it's so incredible when we consider our identity as sons and daughters, our identity as conquerors over whatever circumstance we're in. And there's even more. So when God begins to make these declarations over our identity, it can become a part of us rooted so deeply. I'd like to read from Revelation 22. This is really a precious place where we see at near the end of the scripture in, in, in the Bible as we find the book of Revelation laying out all of these beautiful images of what it is to be like God, to be with him, to, to experience this river of life. So just, just stay with me. 
Revelation 22 and verse 1, the angel showed me the river of the water of life flowing with water clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. And it's 12 kinds of ripe fruit according to each month of the year. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. And every curse will be broken and no longer exist. For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there in the city. Now, of these promises, what if it's true that every curse will be broken. What if that's really true? Because maybe you're living your life and you feel the weight of curses that people have hurled at you. And you feel under the burden of those curses. And you feel like it's outside of your control. And the fact is, it says every curse will be broken and no longer exist. It's as if it never happened. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there in the city. You see, those two are opposed to one another. The curse over here is something that happens. It says, but, but there is the throne of God here in the city standing opposed to any curse that was hurled at you. And you know what's even greater is what it talks about. It says, His loving servants will serve Him. They will always see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. These truths are almost too good for us to take in is to to picture this place because it may not feel like a real place to you, but it's a real place that God has prepared. It is what this place he has prepared for you looks like. Imagine a place where you can see his face every day. That he's standing in front of you just like a friend stands in front of you today. And maybe you can look at a friend who's been standing with you. And you recognize Jesus in them as they've been in the fire with you. God was just reminding me of that as we were singing that song, Another in the Fire. How Jesus appeared in that fire. with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I realized in the times in my life when I was in the fire, I had Jesus in the fire with me. And Jesus showed up in my friends around me as they were in that fire together with me. And I recognize these words in the book of Revelation are true. It says, verse 5, night will be no more. And they will never need the light of the sun or a lamp because the Lord God will shine on them. And they will reign as kings forever and ever. Now guys, I can't even really put my arms around this it says that night will be no more it's just a kingdom that is constantly light it's like it's too much to take in you know my physical body needs rest I need darkness of night so I can rest and I can become refreshed But see, this Revelation 22 is talking about a place where the river of the Spirit of God flows continually. It is the kingdom of light and it needs no lamp because the glory of God fills the place. And there's no curse. Every curse is broken. 
What if it's true that right now you could be seated in heavenly places with him? This kingdom that is described in Revelation 22, it is yours. This is your kingdom, the kingdom of light. And see, there's something else that happens in this kingdom of light is that everything is exposed to the light. I don't know it, how your life has looked, but I can open up the book of my life and say there have been mistakes that I didn't want to shed light on, that I didn't want people to see, that I was ashamed of. And in my shame, I didn't want the world to see those mistakes and I thought it was best to keep them hidden. And you know, God had another way and he said, it's time to deal with those things. And he started to reveal them. And then as those things were revealed, it brought new light into my life to deal with that stuff so I could receive the fullness of who he was calling me to be. And now anytime, if you are making any kind of a mistake is to allow his light to shine on it because his light's shining anyways. And there is no place to hide in his kingdom because it's constantly lit up from the glory of God. It doesn't need the light of the sun. It doesn't even need a lamp because the glory of God is shining continually. And did you know that you are called to be sons and daughters of light? Isn't that beautiful? What if it's true? Let's look at more promises. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Now the first part of this is really great to begin with. It's talking about we may keep coming to him who is the living stone. Jesus, though he was rejected and discarded by men, he was chosen by God and is priceless in God's sight. Come and let us be his living stones. Did you catch that? Not only do we receive Jesus as our living stone, he's calling us to be living stones. Now, I'll have more on this in a moment on what that really means. But see, we are called to be living and solid as a rock. We are his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for God. Do you see that the sanctuary that God's building is something that will not perish? It's an everlasting sanctuary that is built on the hearts of his people. And it says, For now you serve as holy priests, offering up spiritual sacrifices that he readily accepts through Jesus Christ. And more on those stones, I like to read Isaiah 55, verses 11 and 12. And so also will be the word that I speak. It will not return to me unfulfilled. It will not return void. For my word performs its purpose and fulfills the mission I sent it out to accomplish. For you will leave your exile with joy and be led home wrapped in peace. The mountains and hills in front of you burst into singing. The rocks cry out. And the trees of the field will applaud. Now think about this. If the rocks are crying out to the goodness of God, what are the living stones? These living stones are crying out. And there is a passage in Luke where Jesus is speaking to the crowd and he says, even if... No one is left to praise him. The rocks will cry out the goodness of God. And yet, 
Here we are. We are called to be his living stones that call out the glory of God. I don't know about you, but God speaks to me when I'm out in nature. I've been out on a mountain and I have seen his glory speak to me in a way that my heart receives that's only beautiful and only good and not wrecked by any form of humanity that doesn't understand God. It's just beautiful and it's so huge the sky is huge the rocks are huge and the mountains and the hills out in song to glorify who he is and the trees of the field applaud his name you see that's what it looks like when we recognize our place as children of God, that we are his living stones. And it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. If there are curses that are going out, if there are harsh things that are being said, it doesn't matter because the living stones cry out the goodness of God And the trees of the field applaud to his name. The mountains and the hills burst into singing. And what's more, as we come into this spirit of being sons and daughters of God, there is so much promise in us. The book of Ephesians I find is that place. It lays out our heavenly identity. I love how the Passion Translation interprets this and tells us these truths about being sons and daughters of God. I'd like to read in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3. Just a moment. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. That is why we celebrate him with all our hearts. Now just that verse by itself is incredible. It's talking about the depth of his love. And when he looks at us, he looks at us as already being wrapped around by Jesus himself. Jesus who is perfect, who is made as a perfect offering for us. So he looks at us and he sees goodness. He sees the way that he created us. He doesn't see the mistakes and the things that where we have just got it wrong. He sees the goodness that he created in us from the beginning of time. Isn't that awesome? Because he sees us wrapped into Christ. See, that means that he is seeing us fully. It's not that he needs Jesus to come in and blind him from all of our mistakes. That's not it. He's not scared of it. But he's able to see who we truly are and who we're called to be. Verse 4, and in love he chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. I don't know about you, but I've got to come today and confess that the worst person in my life in calling out my weaknesses and my mistakes is myself. I don't know if you have had that encounter yourself, but I want to tell you that you don't have to live that way. Listen to what Jesus says here. He chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. Because of his great love, he ordained us 
that we would be seen as holy in his eyes. And look at this phrase. Holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. So do you know what? Whatever identity you've given yourself because of your mistakes, that's an improper identity. Tear it away. Rip it away. Because there is an unblemished innocence that is who he made you to be. Because you're a child. You're a child of God. And he says, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these as he was holding a child on his lap. That's who you are. And God talked to me one day about my identity. I was like a three or four year old. And my mom used to call me Bubbly Danny. Because all I could do is just... I was just bubbly, the joy of life, and all these things that were happening. I was just so joy-filled, and I could only just talk about those things, and I was grateful, and I had, I had hope on my life, and I hadn't experienced all these setbacks. And see, bubbly Danny is who he calls me to be today, an unblemished innocence, unstained. What if it's true that we could go back to that version of ourselves as that child? What if it's true? Verse 5, For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the Anointed One, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace for the same love he has for the beloved Jesus he has for us. Wow. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. See, again, he's calling us delightful children. He's calling us unified. We are in union with Jesus. And the same way that he loves Jesus, he loves us. Do you see that? Jesus is perfect and without sin. He hasn't even made a single mistake. And God looks at us the same way as he looks at Jesus? Wow. What if it's true? Could that be true? Verse 7, since we are now joined to Christ, we have been given the treasures of redemption by his blood. The total cancellation of our sins, all because of the cascading riches of his grace. The superabundant grace is already powerfully working in us, releasing all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. I've got to say those verses as I read them right now today. Five years ago, I would have said, wow, that's really pie in the sky. I don't think that's even possible. But I'm telling you, I have seen God's grace flow exactly as is written in those scriptures. It's happened right here at Ignite. It's happened through his people speaking Because as his people speak and give hope and life into a situation, you see, it's not about recognizing even what the enemy is doing at all. It's speaking forth what God is saying. It's the super abundant life that he is calling out. And it doesn't matter what mistakes have happened. What matters is the abundance of his grace. And see, those verses are true. I have seen his superabundant grace pour out lavishly through the words of his prophets who are still speaking today. I have seen people encounter his love so deep that it rattles their core. And they receive him deeply. Like back to that place of that three, four-year-old that's bubbly. And on fire for God. I've seen it. And I know that it's true. 
the superabundant grace is already powerfully working in us, releasing all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. And you know what? In that same season that I saw all of this wonderful nature of God poured out, I saw his wisdom poured out as well. And we can read through the book of Proverbs and we can see how wisdom is personified and how it comes alive and is made into flesh and to Jesus. Jesus himself was wisdom personified. He came in every situation ready to respond. And I saw wisdom personified. And that, that my friend, is something that I know in my heart and I could not have known it except to experience it as I have. I thank God for his prophets that speak and pour out wisdom. In verse 9, And through the revelation of his anointed one, he unveiled his secret desires to us, the hidden mystery of his long-range plan, which was delighted to implement from the beginning of time. And because of God's unfailing purpose, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of all the ages reaches its climax when God makes all things new in heaven and earth through Christ Jesus. That verse sounds to me like a plan that is completely unwavering and unshakable. I want to be real right now. Let's be real together. Let's just be real. Have you felt like at some point in your life, God had a plan for you and you made mistakes, and you stepped out of it. Any of you feel that that happened? It's okay. It's okay to feel it, to feel as though you stepped out of it. Because I've been there too. And I thought, I just stepped out of his plan, and now I'm in a position that I don't know what to do. Because I don't feel that I'm worthy to be back on that path, back in that plan that he'd set out for me. But see, all of that was a lie. What does it say in this verse? It says, and because of God's unfailing purpose. See, his purpose doesn't fail. We may fail to align with it, but what is our job if we fall out of alignment? It's really simple. We click back into place. That's all that it is. It's a puzzle piece that just got a little disjointed for a period of time. And that puzzle piece can come and click back into place and it can stay there. Because of God's unfailing purpose, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of the ages when God makes all things new in heaven and on earth through Christ Jesus. In verse 11, through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Do you have any clue what that really means? (laughs) Let's say you lived here on the earth and you have a rich uncle and he has millions and millions of dollars and he leaves you five million dollars as an inheritance. You have five million dollars as an inheritance. Now think about that. It's pretty incredible. It makes a lot of things possible, right? 
God actually says right here. He says, we have been claimed by God as his inheritance. We are his inheritance. We are that valuable to him. Legacy is so important to God that we are his inheritance. Before we were even born, he gave us our destiny. That we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in his heart. How many times does God fail? What is left out of the word every? (laughs) You see, this is where we come into alignment with his purpose and his plan over our lives because God does not fail. And in that moment where we recognize we stepped out of alignment and then we now click back into place and we're in alignment once again, what does that feel like? To be back into his plan, back running toward your destiny. What does that feel like? That feels like the joy and the freedom of being that child once again. Being that child who is free. That child who doesn't have a care in the world because you are joined to Jesus Christ. Because God's plans do not fail. What if it's true? I'm going to read this one more time. What if it's true? Through our union with Christ, we have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were even born, he gave us our destiny. That we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in his heart. <laughs> That is my prayer for every one of us. Everyone who hears the sound of my voice today, that is my prayer for you, is that this verse is real for you today. What if it's true? What if the destiny on your life is something that you can look forward to? You spring out of bed every day knowing that you are aligned with the plan and the purpose he has on your life. That you get to go on a grand adventure with him. So let's take some time right now to encounter him. So if you would, close your eyes with me. Uh, If you would, stand and, and we'll close our eyes together. That can be a little difficult to be sitting in your seat and closing your eyes. (laughs) so right now with our eyes closed we we are taking this time to encounter Jesus and right now we see the river of the water of life flowing with water clear as crystal pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And the river is flowing in the middle of the street in the city where we are present with God. And on either side of the river is the tree of life. And here we see the 12 kinds of of ripe fruit according to the months of the year. And the leaves on the tree of life are healing to the nations. And as we experience Jesus in this place, we allow him to break every curse. It no longer exists. The throne of God and the throne of the Lamb 
here in the city. And Jesus, we are so excited to see your face. And we see the excitement on your face to have your kids back. We see the excitement on your face as you have your kids who align with your purpose and your plan. Because that's all that you wanted is to get your kids back. Thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are sufficient. And in this place, we don't need a lamp. We don't need the sun because your glory shines. And you call us to reign as kings forever. I thank you, God, that you've called us to be living stones, that we cry out your goodness. I thank you, God, you have made us with purpose and a destiny. And today, we choose to align as your sons and daughters. We thank you for this river of life that sparkles with joy and radiance. And we know that it is healing. No sickness or disease can stand. And we thank you, Jesus, for calling us into the identity by which you formed us. I thank you, God, for the unique destiny on every life. I thank you that you fulfill every plan and you accomplish every purpose that flows from your heart, God. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen. I bless you today as you go.